first it didn't sound like a scream. It sounded like some kind of a whistle. Ah, the screams of little children. Yes. <laughs> Hey, welcome back to our Stupid React Seeds. I'm Corbin. I'm Rick. Welcome. Hi. How you doing? Doing good? Good. Today we're doing a movie review. And happy 100th birthday to, I'm hoping this is when we're gonna drop this. Uh, <laughs> That's the plan. It's, it depends on if one other thing happens, I the guess. best laid plans of mice and men. Uh, of the, it's a Bengali film by the, um, infamous? Yes. More than famous? Yes. <laughs> if, you, if you don't know that, it's three amigos. Uh, Sachidit Rai. Ray? Rai. 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 I didn't know if, is it both? No. No? I thought somebody said it was both. Is it a Swarya Ray? Might be. No. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> anyways, but it's the 19, what year? 66. 1966 film, uh, Nayak, or The Hero. Is that how you pronounce that? Nayak? Almost. What is it? It's actually Nayok. Because Bengali. Yeah. The O's. The O's. The O's have it. But yes, Nayok, which is Bengali's favorite cereal, Cheerios? Yep. Hmm. No, it would have to be something with fish and rice. <laughs> cereal? Yeah. With fish? Absolutely. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> And the translation for it, it's interesting, and Johnny was asking me the, if that was the, you know, if she thought, after I watched it, if I thought that was the better translation for it, because that's technically not what the root meaning is. I mean, it can be hero, but it really does mean lead actor. Yeah, but obviously in Indian cinema, we know it, it as the hero. Exactly. Even though here, unless it's a superhero movie, you don't call your leads heroes. Right, yeah. and, and I actually, after watching the movie, think that The Hero is... A perfect title. Perfect title. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so 1966, it's uh, en route to Delhi to receive an award. A Bengali film uh, star re-evaluates his success through fellow passengers, dreams, and past experiences. Written, directed by Satyajit Rai, and composed by Satyajit Rai, and then cinematography by... Um, Subrata Mitra. Who I believe was also his cinematographer He's, on the Apu and yes, um, multiple other things, right? Many, many things. Indeed. Uh, starring Sartaj's mom. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Uttam Kumar. And her name is uh, Shumala Tagore. Yes. Uh, Shurmila. I, I realized that Shurmila. halfway, I, I, I think we saw that one scene from this. Right, on the and, train. And then it just, it recalled to me. I was like, oh yeah, that's, and because I was like, oh yeah. Yeah. Is that, is that, is that Sartaj's mom? Yeah, well, I, uh, yeah. They, Uncanny. Uh, he, look, I, I mean, we've seen her obviously more, but man, does he favor his mom. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Uh, your initial thoughts, Rick? Uh, I don't have a paragraph, mm -hmm. but of the Sartaj Rai things we have seen thus far, this is my favorite. Over the Apu. As much as the Opu trilogy is groundbreaking, undeniable. And it is a meteoric rise debut, especially with the first one for him. I, um, I like this for the same reason I prefer Beethoven over Mozart. Mm. This is, to me, a f of the things we've seen, this is by far and away his most personal work. Mm and it's got some flaws and mm -hmm. i like the flaws yeah in the same way that beethoven when he wrote everything was scratched and sc i i feel like this was really a, a work of uh where the other one had a lot of his vision and his tech technology and his flexing his muscles as the director yeah i felt like this one tapped more into if that one was autobiographical storytelling i felt like this one was a therapy session inside the mind of Sachi Jut Rai. Yeah. And because of that, um, I mean, it's it, it's hard to pick the two as far as what's the better film, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I, this is my favorite of his films because I think it's so, I think it's so freaking personal and I think it is so brilliant and different than the things we've seen him do in many respects. And yeah. I'll get into that, but uh, I, I, I loved it. That, 
That was shocking to me that you said you would love to above a poo. Yeah, that's crazy. This is my favorite of his as well. Hey, because uh, <laughs> it, I was got, I was watching it and I was like, this is extremely different, mm -hmm. which makes me respect him even more. Yep. The fact that even though a poo, the, the poo trilogy, three films. And then the other one, which I always forget the name of it, it's with I the, wife, the wife, uh, which I, I enjoyed, Rick didn't enjoy as much, but, uh, yeah, that would be my least favorite of the ones we've that, seen. that was a little, at least similar to Apu in terms of style wise, in yes. terms of all. And so I was like, okay, this is this type of director we have. And then he kind of just kicked everything out. Oh, sure did. Uh, and it was like, oh, okay. So you could do, you could do a bunch of different stuff. Yeah. This is the most stylized film of his. I, I, obviously, we haven't seen a lot of who this is what. Three of Pooh trilogies, one other film. So this is our fifth. fifth. Plus uh, sixth if you count the short film, too. Two, yeah. Right. Um, but I thought this was incredibly smart. It was incredibly a uh, classic feel to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it it gave me, even though it wasn't um, like sci-fi-y, it gave me Twilight Zone. That's it, right? I said that many times. I was watching it with, uh, with Indrani. She saw it as a little girl mm -hmm. and was re-watching it with me. And there were, especially the nightmare sequences, mm -hmm. I said, okay, if he wasn't a Rod Serling fan mm -hmm. and didn't like the Twilight Zone, then this is a strange, uncanny coincidence. Yeah. It, it's, and the Twilight Zone always had some sci-fi-y slash supernatural kind of thing going on behind it. This didn't have that, but it had the vibes, uh, especially in the dream sequences and a lot of cinematography. Yo. It's just, even some of the, the score behind it, even though it was a very him score, uh, which was reminiscent of a lot of his other films, uh, even though a lot of it didn't have score behind it. Uh, I thought it had a lot of the vibes, and I, I really, really enjoyed that. And I love the style, like stylistic feel of the whole thing, uh, that he took some risks with sure it. Did. Uh, and I, I always enjoyed it. So yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I really, really enjoyed this film. I, 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 let's talk about him. I enjoyed his performance a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, it, this is our first time seeing, um, say his name? Utam Kumar. Which I know he was a Bengali legend. Big, right? Monster movie star. Indrani's mom had a big movie star crush on him growing up. In fact, when we were watching it, her, her mom came in to bring her some cha and biscuits to eat and saw what was on the TV and I saw her stop. And then she sat down on the bed next to Indrani. <laughs> and then she stayed there. It was the remaining half hour of the film. He just stayed the whole time watching. It was, it was great. So yeah, he's... A huge Bengali star of the day. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed his performance. Uh, it was all over the place because uh, obviously you went through a whole a whole bunch, and I thought it was smart of him to get an actual star for this role. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because obviously this the, the character he's playing is a massive star. I thought of him almost like a an SRK level star, right? Absolutely. Even though his personality isn't much like SRK, mm -hmm. but his the stardom. Correct. Correct. So that's what I was envisioning. A SRK level star. A legend. Um, that is, you know, even SRK talked about it in one of his interviews that we saw. Mm -hmm. Of like, he has to be conscious of what his audience wants. He's was for a long time tied to the box office. Yep. Which a lot of, one of the big things I liked about this is what Sachin Rai had to say about the movie industry. Oh yeah. Which, you know, we echo a lot <laughs> today. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, he, I have so much to say about this, and before warning you, uh, Indrani and I have already done a 30 minute afterthought. Oh, really? Yeah, so yeah. I'll be putting the afterthought up nice. because there's so much to talk about. So anything we didn't get into here, you can yeah. go to my personal channel. Yeah. There's gonna be an afterthought between, we, I have her Skyped in so you can see and hear her. Um, I felt like, I mean, we could spend the whole time, and I, I won't because it's on that afterthought, but I could spend the whole time just talking about what I think he was symbolizing what he was talking about. And as it pertains to that, one of the first lines at the very beginning that I found to be very intriguing was when he was explaining to her that he had been uh, accused of being a puppet by his theater teacher. Yeah. And he said to her, was Marlon Brando a puppet? Mm -hmm. uh, and James Dean. James Dean. And he's genuinely trying to figure that out. And she, and I'll mention this obviously in the afterthought, but for, for me, this was such a deep thing, and I don't think he meant any uh, one person to represent exactly the same thing. I think there were people on the train that represented aspects of his own personality, mm -hmm. and I think there were people on the train that asked, that represented circumstances that he's been in, mm -hmm. and I thought she, for me, was, this was 
the voice of his conscience. Yeah. She was Jiminy Cricket. Yeah, it was, their chemistry was off the Beautiful. Charts. Beautiful. It was, it was wonderful. I mean, and she... We, we, this is our first the, time actually seeing her. She's a wonderful actress. Well, no, we saw her in the Opu trilogy. Oh, that's She's right. in the that's third right. one. That's right, that's and right. And that's what I was just going to say, was when yeah. we first saw her in that, it was obvious. Yeah. It was like, okay, yeah, you're made for cinema. Yeah, gorgeous. You're so beautiful to look at. And what I love... And this is a, guys, um, there's a point in the film, this same segment, where he's talking with her, and he says, everything we learned about movies, we learned from America, and everything we learned about acting. And if you notice in this film, if you watch this film, and this is 1966, and th thank you, Marlon Brando and Lee Strasberg and everybody who was at... <laughs> The, the pinnacle in James Dean yeah. of method acting and grounding the work in, in realism and believability mm -hmm. because the groundedness of this is what we're looking for mm -hmm. in, in modern day cinema because it's been since the days in the inception, since Streetcar Named Desire hit, it's been about realism and believability. Unless and the film, call, like, unless like it a, calls like for a, like a artistic producer. choice, right? Unless there's an artistic decision by the director or the style of the film itself to take it in a direction that this is what you're supposed to be as actors. Everybody in this was really doing their, especially our two leads, yeah. I felt, were grounded. I loved some of the choices that he made to accentuate that, where he just had a static shot of the two of them. And I really enjoyed how he did just the slow pan, he said something, and then the slow pan, she was now talking. Mm -hmm. And then the slow pan, he says something. And the dream sequences, mm -hmm. Lot to say about those, but stylistically, if you just turned those on and didn't know what you were watching, you'd think you're watching the Twilight Zone. Absolutely. Yeah. Especially the one with the money. It was the cinematography. The shout out once again to uh, Sacha Sacha Rai and um, um, uh, say his name. Uh, Subrata Mitra. Man, the cinematography, especially in that scene. I mean, the whole thing, the lighting, of course, was wonderful, especially for black and white. It's yeah. just it's it's an art form in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, but. The dream sequence was something out of a a, a classic, like it almost felt horror. It did, like it did, and even, it, even though the film wasn't horror, that's what it felt like. And that's a bit. good place to talk about, like that first nightmare when he had the, the piles of money. It does convey the obvious warnings about and the negativity about uh, movie stars. Doing it for the love of money, right? Mm -hmm. But I really felt it went a lot deeper into the psyche of Satyajit Rai and the recognition of if you were in this position yourself, don't be so quick to judge. And I think he was dealing with that himself because this is 10 years after Opu, mm -hmm. right? So he's got an established sense of stardom himself, mm -hmm. notoriety, money making, and that's, that's intoxicating and no one is immune to it. No matter how much you think you're immune to it, Stallone said this recently about, you may think, well, if I had that money, I'm never gonna do that, I'm never gonna do that. And then the next thing you know, you're on a yacht with 50 of your friends in the middle of the Caribbean and you're like, crap, I'm doing it. Yeah. Uh, because it's that difficult to turn away from. Mm -hmm. And I love the symbolism of what I think he meant as opportunity with the skeletons holding the phones ringing and that now that you're at this place and at first you're relishing in the fact that you're making the money, but now the artist in you is realizing that you've sold yourself to the highest bidder. Mm -hmm. And all the phone calls that come in are harder and harder for you to turn away from because each of them is connected to this big stash of money. Mm -hmm. And as he sucks into it, what's the thing he remembers and looks toward? His theater teacher who connected him to the love of the art, who doesn't pull him out, mm -hmm. reaches, but he himself, and Johnny pointed out, has decayed. Everything about why he was doing what he was doing as an artist had grown so old and broken and distant from him. Yeah. And he was now a victim of his own creation by having chosen box office, money, and fans yeah. over artistry and audience and I thought I thought creativity. The, the writing did it really subtly as well of leaving this story. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love the whole it's just a train ride uh, thing. Uh, it's just, and that's that's the entire thing. He talks to all these different people. I love the every conversation between the main two leads. I love the conversation with the old guy. Oh, that was fantastic! Especially at the end when he's drunk and he's he just drunk. comes in, and they're just both looking at each other, and the old guy just does this because yeah. <laughs> he told him. But that too, I thought because Indrani asked me what I thought about the old guy. She said, "Did you think that represented him? What do you think that represented 
you know, who, who, what was it? I said, I don't, I don't want to oversimplify. I mean, I think the train itself uh, is the recognition of this journey that every artist is on, but this journey that Satya Jiraiya is on in his life. And that I think, and we met it early on, I really do think if, if he was around, that would be pointing to the societal mindsets that have become so strictured and so calcified in the name of higher morality that they've missed the point that what they're fighting for isn't for things that are morally upright. What they have done is become religiously, religiously legalistic yeah. and missed the realities of just human existence and, and the level of what life really is in the name of, I have the moral high ground. Yeah. And how that impacts people's, not just their lives, but their, their artistry. Yep. Yeah. One of my favorite um, uh, stylized shots, it only happened a few times, every single time you put on his glasses. Yes. It got in a really close up side shot. That was in, on purpose. Yeah. And he became the hero. Every right. single time he put on those glasses. And from the beginning when he got on the phone call to when he got off the train to yep. I think there was one other time as well. But every single time he put on that basically a facade, he yes. became yes. the hero. His voice yeah. changed, his, his mm -hmm. demeanor changed. The shot was a very stylistic shot. And the eyes are the window to the soul. And yes, a lot of celebrities will wear sunglasses because the flashes of the photography are just blinding and you can't see. Mm -hmm. But many of them are using it as a protective thing and to hide themselves. And I found it a beautiful juxtaposition to have his conscience wearing clear glasses the whole time. And I loved at the end, the difference between, I mean, when, when she says goodbye, I said out loud, don't let her go. And I meant it, I meant it twofold. I meant it relationally. Mm -hmm. Like I think he found the, the perfect match. She's mm -hmm. somebody who would not be enamored with him, but she would relate to him as who he is. You know, the difference between Michael Jackson versus Michael, mm -hmm. right? When they get off the train, he's got the glasses on and he's in celebrity mode and he's, he's in what he's in. But the difference with her is that She's just very down to earth and practical and with that person who I think was her dad. And I do think, I'll ask you this question before I answer it myself. Do you think he ends the journey changed? And I have something to point to that, that is evidence of my answer to that question. Do you think he ends the uh, train travel changed? And if so, for the better or for the worse? I don't know, I could see it. I could see both. I'm glad such as Ryan did it the way he did. I Me mean, too. I, you know I love those endings. That Let's you decide. I, I'm, I'm hoping they never met ever again. Uh, that's just my hope. Uh, <laughs> I want it to be like, this was just a passing. It was a great passing relationship. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping, and I love the way he just, she walked off screen, he was talking to them, and it just, the end. Yeah, I did too, um, I love that. I don't, I don't know if he changed. I, I, I could I could I could see that he that he did, but I don't know. I have a feeling I'm a skeptic. I, I think he did, and this is where I think it isn't my own imposition of optimism on the movie. I think it's evidenced by this. I think the the relationship he has, small as it is, with the girl with the fever. Hmm. So when he first gets on, she's just watching him. And she's not like other fans. Now granted, she doesn't feel well. But all she is is smiling and amazed that the star that she loves is there. And the mama says that we've seen all your movies except your most recent one because she's been sick. Mm -hmm. And it really doesn't dawn on him at the moment what's occurring. Then he comes in later and he's noticing her. Mm -hmm. He didn't really notice her before. But now he notices her and he puts his hand on her and makes says, hey, your fever's come down. And he recognizes this one isn't a fan who wants something for me or his, who is deifying me and kneeling and worshiping at the altar of who I am. She's, she genuinely is someone who loves my artistry. Mm -hmm. And then when he sits down later on, she's in her mama's lap and he asks her if she, uh, the mom says, can you do a favor for her if she wants an autograph? And he says, oh, give me your autograph book. And the mom says, she doesn't have an autograph book. And it registers with him. It's huge that she doesn't have an autograph book. She's not a celebrity hunter. She's not a gossip monger. She doesn't collect autographs. The only reason she wants his autograph is because of her, there'll be a remembrance of that personal connection. Mm -hmm. And he writes it, not on a napkin, 
not on some random, he actually takes the time to find a picture of himself and writes on it. And if I'm not mistaken, he's not wearing glasses in the picture. Mm. It's a headshot with the glasses off. And to me, that symbolized that this trip, I think brought him back to the place where maybe Sachi Jirai himself was struggling at the time with his fame mm. of, it's so tempting to now make things that the audience wants or that the people around me want or the people who give me money to make what I want, want. But am I gonna be true to what I really do this for? Am I gonna do this because I love the art form or am I gonna do this because now it's what the audience expects of me? Mm -hmm. And he proved his decision by the film, this film itself. This film is not made for box office success. Yeah. This is made for the fi film festival circuit. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. Really, really enjoyed it. There's so much we could obviously talk about. Um, yeah, I said I got a 30-minute afterthought already. But, yeah, uh, we, we wanted to get to at least one uh, for his birthday. We're going to get to every one of his work before before uh, it's all over and we either are, are dead. Uh, <laughs> oh, and by the way, who who's the girl? She was great. I, one of my favorite moments in the movie is the scene where he's thinking about, daydreaming about the girl who came to him and said she wants a part, and he said, are you married? And she bursts into tears. Mm -hmm. And then he said, what's the matter? She said, see, I can act. That was great. Yeah. I love that scene. Yeah, uh, I don't know who she was. I can't, I don't remember her name. And there's also, we could say a lot, and I do in my afterthought thing, about the man with the pipe who runs the apex and the, the, the girl who, I think the man with the pipe is another aspect of Saji Jirai, oh, yeah. but again, we could... There's, there's a whole bunch. Hours. This film has a lot to say, uh, and I think it does it really, really well. Um, so, let us know what the next such Rye film we should watch. I hear the music room is really good. Uh, no, obviously, I'm sure. I don't know if it's going to be any good. His track record is... Yeah, he has a bad track record. He's probably made two good films. Yep. And they're both named a poo. Yeah. Actually, none of them are named a poop. No, they're no. names of them. Let yeah. us know. None of them are. Who is never. Anyway, uh, let us know what's the next such at Rye film should be down below. <laughs>